Here is a 1950 Philco AM FM radio in a wooden cabinet. Uh, my pastor's son picked this up at an estate sale and he asked me to fix it for him if possible. So let's turn it on and see what happens. Let it warm up a little bit. I'll pause the camera while that's taking place. Okay, we're on FM. We have a little reception, but very weak and distorted. Right out from under my life. It's a little better, but it should be a lot better. Okay, let's see about AM. Obviously this band selector is very dirty. Well, AM appears to be dead. Okay, let's open this joker up and see what we can do to make it behave. Okay, here's the chassis removed from the cabinet. And one thing I don't like about Philco radios from the from this era is the way they have the loop antenna designed. You can see it's stapled around the cabinet. And these wires are soldered to the chassis, which are very fragile wires, I might add. It's really not a good idea to try to work on one of these chassis without first unsoldering the wires and getting everything out of the way, because otherwise you may break the loop antenna leads for testing. You can just connect the loop to the chassis with alligator clip leads. Okay, the first thing I want to do is clean the switches and controls with this contact cleaner. We, we already determined the band switch was dirty. Okay, I've cleaned the tube sockets, the volume control, and the band selector switch. We'll now test FM and see if its performance has improved any. Well, they're kind of hanging out and sweating it. Right. Both of those efforts are so Leah Michelle, explain yeah, Not really. Well, our controls may not be as intermittent, but we still have a ways to go. Okay, the first thing I'd like to do is check the power supply to make sure it's outputting the proper voltage. And as you can see, this uses a selenium rectifier. And one of the symptoms of a bad selenium rectifier is weak output voltage. And I want to check that now and make sure that's with intolerance. Okay, we have 112 volts, 113 volts on the uh, selenium rectifier. That might be a little bit low. Think about this. I can tell you that the alignment's off because we're tuned to 101.3, but according to the dial, it's coming in at around 100. So we'll have to align the FM oscillator. Well, I will have to say this set's pretty sensitive because we're tuned to an oldie station about 90 miles away with just a clip lead on the FM antenna. So that's not bad. Okay, back to the power supply. The schematic calls for 135 volts on the cathode of the selenium rectifier. Let's see what we have here. About 111 volts. And actually, I've been monitoring this voltage for the five or ten minutes this set's been on, and it, it, it keeps dropping the longer the set warms up. And I suspect that's due to this selenium rectifier, so let's go ahead and replace that with a silicon rectifier diode and an appropriate dropping resistor. Since the silicon diode has less voltage drop across it than the selenium does, if we were to use a diode without the dropping resistor, our B plus voltage might be too high. Generally, we consider the, the Type 1N4007 as a suitable rectifier for this purpose. 
However, I have something here a little bit heavier, a 1000 PRV 2.5 amp. I have several packs of these, so we might as well put them to good use. I'll have to look it up, but I think a 4007 is a 1 amp diode, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, just to show you what we're doing, our AC comes in here. Our dropping resistor will connect between this point and the anode band of the diode, and then the cathode band of the diode, which is denoted by the stripe here, connects to the first filter as can be seen on the schematic here. Now we'll just experiment with several different values of resistors until we get the one that gives us close to the uh, schematic specified B plus voltage. And that resistor value is usually between somewhere between 22 and 82 ohms depending on the set that you're using it in. Okay, I've settled on a 27 ohm resistor. That gives us 133 volts. That's close enough to the schematic's 135 volts that it won't know the difference. And it's been on for several minutes. And our B plus is staying at 133 volts. It's not dropping down like it did with the old selenium rectifier after it warmed up. And I suspect after I replace some, some of the old capacitors that the B plus voltage will probably come up another few volts. So we're just going to stick with the 27 ohm resistor and call it good. And there we go. Selenium rectifier problem taken care of. And now we need to deal with all of these, all of these wax paper capacitors that need to be replaced. Okay, the capacitor replacement is coming along nicely, and I'm about to replace the multi-section electrolytic can capacitor. Uh, even though there was no hum, I decided just to do a spot check of the capacitor in the cathode bypass section for the output tube, which is rated at 25 microfarad. It only reads something like 3 microfarad. And I learned a long time ago, the hard way, on these multi-section capacitors that if one section fails, it's usually not too long before the other ones go south. I remember a couple of television sets that I fixed that I got lazy and replaced only the bad section of the capacitor, and in both cases, within two weeks, the TVs came back with the other section that failed. So we're just going to go ahead and replace this whole thing, and I will analyze the high voltage sections of this capacitor just to see what kind of shape they're currently in. Okay, I want to show you something regarding resistors. This is the resistor going to the filter capacitor off of the rectifier diode. Schematic calls for 150 ohm, 1 watt. This is 130 ohm. I don't know whether somebody had replaced this or whether this is a production change, but it really doesn't matter. Well, mounting the new filter capacitors, the way I'm mounting them, this resistor was a little bit too big to fit where I needed it to fit. So I had these brand new 150 ohm resistors. Now looking at that, that doesn't look over a half watt resistor, judging by its physical size. But according to the, the specifications on these resistors, they are two watt resistors. I guess we'll know if that's really true or not when, when we apply power to the radio and the resistor burns up. Okay, there we go. Two out of the four capacitors replaced. It's amazing how much smaller these components have gotten, which is helpful to me. That means we can stuff these capacitors under the chassis and they not be in the way of anything. Okay, here we are with the capacitors and a few new resistors installed on terminal strips. I went with 200 volt capacitors instead of the original 150 volt capacitors because when you turn the set on, there's an initial surge voltage close to 180 volts until the tubes warm up and then the voltage drops back down to around 135. Well. Capacitors, filter capacitors generally have a surge voltage rating, which means they can take a momentary over voltage without damage. But I thought it thought we'd better be safe and sorry, so I went ahead and installed 200 volt capacitors. 
and surprisingly the original filter capacitor can tested okay except for the open cathode bypass section which is a low voltage section it's generally the high voltage sections that open up okay let's fire it up and make sure we have everything wired correctly if we have everything wired correctly it should play if we don't well it might well I must have done something right it's playing but we still have things to do to improve the situation Okay, here we are on AM. It's doing reasonably well. You fathers and you mothers be good. And FM. Need to hook the antenna back up, but I had to adjust the FM oscillator slug to get the stations to come in on the right point on the dial. Okay, here we are. The 1950 Philco back together on the AM band. From it, but never Seems to be pretty sensitive on the high end of the dial, but I believe this tuning condenser has a short, and it dies on the low end, but I played around with it and really didn't have any luck clearing that short, but that's okay, because all he wants is the local stations anyway. In fact, I doubt he'll even be listening to AM on this set. Now we're on FM. Going to be nationally organ. Ken Eastern tonight, Hannity Fox. So just to recap, what I did was replace the selenium rectifier because it was failing after it warmed up. I replaced a bunch of leaky capacitors, both of paper and electrolytic. Well, actually, the, le the electrolytic was in pretty good shape, but I went ahead and replaced it anyway because the cathode bypass section of the cam was open. I replaced the dial bulb Support and I touched NPR up the alignment a little bit. Stations. And it seems to be working fairly well now. I think he'll be happy. Okay, there you go. Thanks for watching and more to come later. Now here's the singing rage, Miss Patty Page. I joked about that record, the Milwaukee Polka. Yes, you did. <laughs> because that, I'm told, wasn't one of the most astonishing hits of the career of Jack Rail and Patty Page. No, it wasn't. But luckily, it did make the charts. Oh, Not only in Milwaukee, uh-huh. It did? Yeah, really. Did you expect it would be a no. big hit? Well, I think Jack did because, you know, being from Milwaukee, it was very close to his heart. Mm -hmm. And that's why he wanted me to record it. Do you know how many people think that you were born in Tennessee because of the oh, loss? Oh, of course, I know that. But you're from Oklahoma? Yeah. Where? Born in Claremore, Oklahoma. Now, where is Claremore? Well, that's about 30 miles uh, northeast of uh, Tulsa. Uh, Will Rogers' hometown, okay. better known for that. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the greatest things that ever happened to me was they named a street after me in Claremore. 
No. Right next to Will Rogers Avenue. Oh, and when did they do that? This was about three, four years ago. Oh, okay. So that it's uh, recently. Mm -hmm. It's nice Great. when, a, isn't it nice when a hometown does that? Oh, it was oh, unbelievable. The, the, the Jack Benny High School in uh, in uh, Waukegan, Illinois. Yeah. I think that's terrific. Really great. It impressed my son. That's the only thing that has impressed him. <laughs> How much did you sing as a child when you were growing up? Well, all of us sang. Uh, there were eleven children, so uh, there were eight girls and three boys, and uh, three of us had a trio, and we used to work around, you know, the Rotary Clubs and mm -hmm. all, you know, Muskogee and Avon, Oklahoma, where mm -hmm. I, my father was a railroad man. So, uh, now, what did he do for the railroad? Well, he finally became a section foreman. But before that, he was just a worker, you know, on the, the, uh, the railroad mm -hmm. tracks. Mm-hmm, Gandy dancer, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. And, he didn't uh, drive the trains. No, no, no. I have two brothers that uh, were trainmen, but uh, my father was the section hand. Mm -hmm. you know? And he had really that little putt-putt on the, on the track. Oh, yeah. Yeah and used to pick the poke greens by the railroad. The which? Poke. Poke greens. I don't know what those are. Well, you're not from the Middle South, right? No. The middle... <laughs> I'm Middle West, Midwest. Wisconsin, Milwaukee. But no, no, but poke greens grow alongside the track. To eat them? And sure, they're great. Well, it tastes You know, like... poke salad, Annie, did you ever hear that No, never have. Record? You're kidding me. No, I'm not. No. There was a big uh, country song called Poke Salad, Annie. Well, what does it taste like, Pats? Well, it's like a green, but more like probably bitter like uh, escarole. Mm -hmm. The Italian green. Yeah. Mm. So what got you from singing with your sisters as a trio to the singing rage, Miss Patty Page? Well, I, I guess it was uh, luck, really, Tom, because I started singing on a radio station in Tulsa, and that's where I got the name, uh, with the milk company. And um, nobody wanted Clara Ann Fowler, so they changed it to Patty Page because the Page Milk sponsored the show. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had it my last three years of high school. And then Jack, whom we've talked about before, still my manager and partner, uh, came through Tulsa with a territory band through the Midwest. And he heard me sing and called me up and came to see me in a little club that I was working. Took one look at me and said, no, no, um, she's not what I would picture in front of a band. She's not sexy looking. And she's, <laughs> she's about as wide as she is tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do I get out of this? And I guess he thought he got out of it gracefully, but I must have been too dumb to listen to him because I took uh, an air check off of the radio show and sent it to him. And when he heard the voice again, he thought, well, there may be something there. And that's how I uh, started recording. Really, it was much longer and, and much later than that. But um, during that time, he went around to all different record companies trying to peddle Patty Page to them. That's hard to do, I guess, isn't it? To get to a record company to, what did they, sign you up to a contract? Or? Well, at that time, you know, the record business has changed so much uh, now. But at that time, uh, they did sign just four sides is what uh, I recorded. And they, you know, it's kind of like a trial period. And I think all of my family are the only ones that bought the four records. <laughs> <laughs> two records. <laughs> and there were enough of them to I'll buy bet they're collector's items yeah. now. You know, some of those discs are very, yeah, very, very expensive. Really were. Man. And uh, that's how it started, really. Uh, and I don't know if other recording artists started that same way, but that is how uh, Jack got the contract for me. So then once the four records, four songs came out, they thought, well, maybe she's got something. And... Uh, until I recorded a song called Confess, where I sang with myself, did any disc jockey really start to uh, play the record? Did you ever have to go around to the, uh, to the radio stations to be interviewed by the disc jockeys? Oh, all the time. We used to do what we call disc jockey tours. Yeah, I know. I was working at a radio station in Wisconsin, and the biggest event would be when um, somebody would come, one of the recording stars, mm -hmm. to be interviewed on the drive time show in the afternoon. Uh, that oh, was sure. really a major, major operation. Major. It yeah. really was. And you used to get up early in the morning to make the six o'clock shows, you know, drive out from Philadelphia, you know, to all the smaller towns outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when it came time for them to vote to the top singer, they'd always vote somebody else. <laughs> 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 it was never you when you did all the shows. <laughs> I used to love that. But uh, it was interesting. Much different business, I think, then than it is now. How do you think it's different now? Or, or how was it different then? I think, I think you're right. I think it was an easier time. And I think, well, it was much smaller. And more attention paid to the stars. Now. I think so, uh-huh. 
Uh, there is much more money to be made now. Uh, your tax structure is completely different. At that time, you know, when I was making all the uh, records, you know, we were like in the 80% bracket. You don't have that anymore. Mm -mm. So, uh, and everyone talks about uh, there's not any money around, but my goodness, the entertainment business is just flourishing. The music business, uh, the record business, record business, the amount of money that is made by these new groups is mm, astronomical. Staggering. Yeah, for making records. Mm. That's I can't believe it. No, I know. I'd like to be in on some of that myself. Could I, well, like, if I would ask you, how much money did you make from Doggy in the Window? Could you give me a number, or would you give me a number? I would if I uh, if you knew if offhand. I knew. Um, you know, it's uh, we sold quite a few million of those, but uh, you know, I couldn't really give you a well back then. Figure. How, how, what did an artist get per record? Like we, uh, when I worked at the radio station, they said, oh, they get two or three cents a record or something like well, that. Well, I don't know. You get like five percent of. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, 98% of, mm -hmm. you know, and then your record clubs are um, separate. Um, so I would have to say at that time, maybe they were selling for a dollar, which they still are, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Something like that. Or maybe 98 cents. But you get 5% of... Um, a certain amount. A certain amount. Probably like 90 Five percent of a hundred. Yeah. So uh, that's the only thing so I'm asking. So you know as much as I do. <laughs> yeah. That's the only question I'm asking you about Doggy in the Way because I'll bet you're probably sick of talking about it. Not really. Okay. Because uh, the other song that I love that you did was Old Cape Cod. Oh yeah. I thought that was a sensational. Yeah, I love that song. Now. I read they gave me stuff to read about Doggy in the Window, and you used to go to the dog pound to get the mutts and <laughs> yeah. give away the kids, is that true? We used to have contests with the record company, and every city that I would go into, and they would name the dog. And then whoever uh, won would get the dog that, uh, that I would use in the show. And there were many lovely things that happened during uh, my holding the little dog on the gowns that I wore and uh, oh, yes. didn't yeah. matter yeah. what yeah. Yeah. happened. <laughs> <laughs> what color should I wear, Jack? We're brown tonight, didn't kid. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wear it. something simple. <laughs> and usually I never knew um, what name won, really. You know, we were out of town fast after that. <laughs> didn't want him to catch us. When you first hit New York, were you a star then? Oh, my goodness, no. No? We thought that possibly because I did you know, like two different shows in Chicago, and uh, on ABC and on uh, CBS, um, that everyone would know who I was, and we got to New York, and nobody had even heard of the shows that I had done. And I auditioned for um, Stop the Music and one other show that um, didn't hire me either. Um, so we had to really start over again. How do you crack that nut? That's a big market you know that's yeah. that is the tough one the record business uh, did it for me mm -hmm. um, and and i want to just check on your name again patty page the the sing and rage were you that on the radio station in tulsa <laughs> no. or were you just patty page just patty page when did the sing and rage come? how do you think that's uh, you, you know like it's always miss peggy lee it's never just peggy yeah. lee uh, you know uh, billing is important naming names are important the way you present names how i guess so uh, that was done just by a continuity writer in uh, in chicago on bbm and uh, i was doing a show with the uh, cesar patrillo and the honey dreamers who were uh, a sure. group at that time and he just said something like, and here's the singing rage, Miss Patty Bay singing, somebody loves me or whatever. Yeah, I don't remember the but song. But did you like it when you heard it? Well, oh, I well, don't know. Well, tell you. Mercury Records liked it, and they started putting it on all the records, and that's how it happened. And you worked with Petrillo. Mm -hmm. He was a tough guy, wasn't he? Well, I don't remember. No, he wasn't the union guy. He was his brother. Oh. One was Jimmy and one was Caesar, wasn't it? Oh, exactly. Jimmy Caesar exactly. or Caesar Jimmy. I think they both had the same name. Yep, but the one that was with the musicians' union, he was a tough guy. Yeah, I understand that. Wow, strike. I don't remember ever meeting him. No, no. We'll be right back with Patty Page after these words from our NBC station, so stick around. Offered to you that you've turned down that then went on to become a, a great big hit, and you said, oh my gosh, I wish we'd have done that? Oh, uh, yeah, there have been quite a few. Um, <laughs> the first one was... Uh, song called If that Perry Como did. And the the last one that I remember If if Now truthfully I don't believe that had I recorded it it would have been a hit. I'm just saying that that uh, I was offered it. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a marriage of uh, the um, song and the person. And also uh, Moon River was sent to me <laughs> and uh, I even took it over to England with me because I was working at, there at the time to play it again for Jack. And he said, I 
don't think that that's for you. It doesn't sound no, very good to me. <laughs> very good to me. Yeah. And, uh, River, Huckleberry, well, who wants all that? that? Sure, that? all the corny lyrics, yeah. right? Mancini, who is he? <laughs> And, uh, well, those are the two most famous ones, I think. There were probably many along the way. I remember turning down one that nobody ever heard of was at the bottom of Lake Erie. And uh, that song is still at the bottom <laughs> of Lake Erie. <laughs> there have been many of those. Yeah. At the bottom of Lake Erie. Lake Erie. How did it go? Could you <laughs> do the first aid for me? <laughs> How do you know if something is right for you to do? I don't think anyone really knows that it's right for them. I, I think that uh, we as performers probably are the worst judges of what is right for us. But I know um, that you enjoy singing it, but you never know if people are going to enjoy hearing it. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Uh, as I said, I don't think anyone really knows uh, what the public wants. And if we did, we'd all be successful. Millionaires. <laughs> Millionaires. All multi-multi-millionaires. Yeah. So it's always a gamble, and I think that's part of the excitement of the business. Are you doing anything now with this technology they have? Uh, you know, the, all the technology that they have in the records where, like, you can sing it once, and then they have eight of you happen and all, all that? I do one thing with a harmonizer on stage. They call it a harmonizer, and uh, where my voice is um, two voices at certain times. And I don't ask me to explain it to you how it happens because it still baffles me. I don't, I keep listening. And how did that ever happen mm -hmm. as I'm really singing? I've heard of that and like if you could plug in enough of them we could have a 32 piece yeah. Patty Page uh -huh. standing up there on the, on, on the stage. They sound kind of weird. Uh, in fact, <laughs> what we programmed it once, it sounded like <laughs> Bugs Bunny doing it. <laughs> if I sing uh, like the voice that's lower then it sounds all right, but the one that's higher sounds just like Mel Blanc doing it. And I was hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't make it. I started laughing. I said, no, Jack, we can't do it that way. It can't be the third above. It's got to be the one below. And what else are you up to these days? Well, actually, this... Uh, I mean, when you're not singing all that, what does a Patty Page do? What does a Patty Page do? Well, I live in a beautiful little village down near San Diego called Rancho Santa Fe. And, um... I love it. You know, that is a super village. Isn't it? I was down there last 4th of July, and Were you? that place is terrific. It's, folks, it's about, what, 80 miles uh, south of L.A.? Mm-hmm, yeah. And there's no smog. Oh, it's just beautiful. And there's beautiful air, mm -hmm. and really nice, nice people. They really are. Now, do you know why they call that Rancho Santa Fe? Well, you probably know a different story than I do. Well, let's the hear Santa yours. Santa Fe Railroad. That's the one, yeah, oh, tell yeah. that. Yeah, that's a good oh, story. Oh, they had uh, uh, bought this particular area to plant eucalyptus trees for the railroad ties. Mm -hmm. And they found, I don't know why eucalyptus trees didn't work for the railroad ties. Maybe you know the story. Bad wood is all I Bad know. Wood? Bad wood? I didn't know how. Uh, it splits a lot. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, so, I, I'm told, yeah, I that's true. Bad wood. We always find the limbs Bad on, wood. <laughs> on the little streets. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how the uh, uh, little village was uh, built. And they uh, couldn't uh, make the trees work for them, so they sold off parcels of mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. And it was the Santa Fe Railroad who owned it. Mm -hmm. Wonder why eucalyptus, though, is no good for railroad. I but you no notice idea. how railroads are running through your life, Patty? He's pa fair. worked on the railroad, brothers are trainmen, now uh -huh. you live in a town that now was I live owned, in a town that was owned, owned by, by the Santa, Santa Fe, Fe Railroad. railroad. You ever thought you were on the wrong track, or should I switch, <laughs> shall I switch this conversation? God, I hope I'll try I to signal you into something else here. <laughs> <laughs> we should go on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Do you? What, going on the road? Uh -huh. Yeah, the road is fun. It is. I, you know what I like about the road? The expense account. I like the... Uh, the greatest thing in the world is being on the road, on the sheet. Well, this you shoot. see, I never had to do that because oh, I have to I? pay for it all myself. I know, but can I tell you, we went to London once, okay? Yeah. For 10 days, on the sheet. Really? We stayed at the Connaught, we stayed at the finest places and just put it all on the big yellow sheet and send it right to the big accountant in the sky. At <laughs> That's Rock where Cross. I lined up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'd like to ask. Say, what do you think of this music that they're playing now? Oh, I think there's so much talent around, Tom, it scares me. Mm -hmm. Really. Um, they really are very, very talented. Um, even with the electronic age, it doesn't take away from uh, the talent that these kids have in writing and in um, uh, performing. Um, unfortunately, there are some that we probably won't hear about because they are engulfed within a group, you know. True. And um, 
they will never be one person per se that we might uh, be familiar with but um, I went to one concert with my children down in San Diego I went to see Peter Frampton I couldn't get over it you know really the the sounds that come out of just four guys up there mm -hmm. were unbelievable mm -hmm. and I think that's what's happening with the uh, with the business um, uh, might be a little harder for someone like me to get you know get a record around is, yeah. Now I'll ask you, is it tough for you to get a record around these days? Oh, I think so, yeah. I think if you're an established personality, people just say, well, we've heard of her before, we don't want to hear her again. Mm -hmm. you know? Now when you do your shows, your concerts and your appearances at clubs and stuff, do you do any new songs or do you, is it all... No, I do a lot of new songs. You do? Mm -hmm. But you've got to have a nostalgia corner somewhere. Oh, sure. Show, I, I finished you? the show with a medley of... Uh, of about 14 or 15 songs that uh, were big ones for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe some of them are only eight bars. But I try to include as many as I can. And if, I, if somebody wants me to do one that um, I don't have in the, uh, in the show, I'll put it in. Re do you take requests? Mm -hmm. Boy, it's like a lounge act. <laughs> well, you know, that's something, because the people that I've gone to see, like uh, like Sammy Davis Jr. or Sinatra, they have a set act that they come out and do. And they don't want to have requests because they don't have arrangements where, uh, the, you know, the conductor isn't yeah. familiar with it, something like that, and so they don't do it. But now you say... Well, no, no, see, this is a different kind of a thing altogether. Like, my whole show is set at the beginning, but at the end, where I do this medley, mm -hmm. and I walk around, you know, through the audience and say hello to people, I have spots in it that it's very easy for me to just say rocky who is my conductor piano player uh could we do uh, i'd rather be sorry or moonlight in vermont or something if people request it mm -hmm. and if i remember the words sometimes i don't remember me that's always fun what is the importance of a singer having his or her own conductor that's something i've always wondered about well, they are almost so much a part of you that they you, they know when you breathe. They know uh, what key you would sing a song in, mm -hmm. uh, and you can start it, and they'll follow you. Um, it's they know when something goes wrong on stage. Um, it's like an unwritten thing. Now, what could go wrong on stage? Have you had, give me? Have you got an example? Oh, well, I could possibly say say if somebody is talking or. Somebody sitting in the ringside and going like this, show me, you know, one uh -huh, of these things. Uh -huh. It affects um, what you do, and, and he will know it. Uh, my drummer, whom I travel with, knows it. Not that they can change it, it's just that you feel a little more comfortable. Yeah, you've got some pals up there. You can go back yeah. and put your hand on the piano. Or something. Yeah, now what do you do when they say, come on, Patty, sing Come On to My House? <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> Does that ever happen? You know what they do most of anything I get a request for that uh. somebody else did is Peggy Lee's uh, Is That All There Is? And they say, you better sing it. And they really think that I recorded it, or th I say to them, now, are they sure, I say to myself, are they sure that they came in to see me tonight? Are they going to be disappointed when they find out I'm not Peggy? Mm -hmm. And she has told me that they come to her and say, you better sing Tennessee Waltz tonight before, I hope you're going to sing Tennessee Waltz. And she does it. Yeah. I said, but Peggy, I can't do your song. Is that all there is? And you're the only one that can do that one. What is the hardest song you've ever done, do you think? Because some songs are really hard. Oh, my goodness. Well, or I does it come easy? Do, 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 no. you, do you hurt when you sing every... <clears throat> do I hurt? Yeah. No, sometimes I can feel it from down here. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I guess the hardest thing that I ever did as far as recording, because I can't do it on stage naturally, is when I had to do four voices that were all written out for me. And I never learned to read music. So I had to really almost learn like four different songs mm -hmm. and put them together. And that was with My Eyes Wide Open, I'm Dreaming, first one. Mm -hmm. And then I did uh, And So to Sleep Again. And then one of my greatest, which I feel was one of my best, was a song that um, Vic Schoen wrote called I Adore You. I loved it. And it never became a big you know, seller for me. But it was a challenge for me to uh, read all that music and record it. Now, what are you doing for Christmas this year? I'm going home yeah. to Tulsa. Oh, you're going to Tulsa. Uh -huh. Have you got family back there? Uh, my mother and uh, about, I guess, three sisters live there. And uh, of the 11 children, I'm the furthest one away. And um, most of the kids live in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, Tulsa, and Perry, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Oklahoma City. What a time you're going to have. Yeah. Now, do you have a piano in the house? No. Oh. 
Can you say, all of you sing a cappella? We never had a piano. No way to play it anyway. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Have a super time out thank there. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for being here. Oh,